The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. Thanks for tuning in today. We're here for you every day at 3 p.m. Eastern. Today we have a classic video for you, and it's called Figure on Park Bench with Sylvia Tribeck. Enjoy. <music> Hello and welcome to the demo on painting people from photographs. Uh, there are certain situations that ask us to paint from photographs as opposed to painting from life, especially when we are dealing with younger people and especially if we are dealing with difficult poses. This is what today's demo will be about. Before I get to the point, I would like to explain my materials. I use oil paint, of course, titanium. titanium white, cadmium yellow, cadmium yellow medium, yellow ochre, cadmium red, alizarin crimson permanent, transparent red oxide, sub-green viridian, and cobalt blue. When it comes to brushes, I prefer to work in larger sizes, as large as I can get, relatively, uh, of course, to the size of canvas. Today we are working on 20 by 24 double all prime linen, medium texture. So these are the brushes. They are all bristles. Uh, this one is bristle blend, and it's an old brush that's actually destroyed by bad Curve, but it's very useful in applying thin glazes. I also occasionally use a palette knife and uh, odorless mineral spirits. Now, when it comes to working from photographs, uh, I selected these images. Uh, this is an enlargement of uh, the larger photograph. You have two figures of young girls incapable of standing still for hours. Um, pretending they are looking somewhere, or maybe they were looking somewhere, actually they're posing for me. And uh, in this case, they create nice circular movement in terms of the way the eye wanders through the composition. Also, uh, I like the fact that they are looking away from the viewer, so there is a nice mood, nice story implied. Because of the setup here, I am not uh, really uh, going to use the background behind. I don't like it, it's busy. However, for some painters it might uh, do. So I selected the photograph of uh, uh, somewhere uh, rose garden. And uh, I'm not going to paint roses, but I like the light um, spots of splashes of nice color and value. And that's what we are going to imply behind the figures. This is what paintings for, from photographs does. In addition to this, uh, in the southern part of the United States, it gets hot and it would be impossible to actually sit outside and boil those people in the sun. I have a sample here of um, a study that I've done from a previous photograph. This painting is not 100% where I would like it to be. And the reason is there are too many diagonal lines. So we are going to choose a more stable composition. Also, um, the model's pose does not, uh, it's really too stretched out, does not do this nice circular movement as in uh, the other photo that I've selected for this particular composition. All right, let's move on with it.
To dilute the paint in initial stages of painting, I use odorless uh, terpenoid or mineral or spirits, and uh, I don't use many, any medium except when I'm traveling. Sometimes I use whatever comes across from a local manufacturer. When it comes to diluting the paint, you use, I use a lot of terpenoid in initial stages, so the whole thing gets saturated. And when I'm looking at the photograph in this case, or a model, I'm trying in my head to plan where the darks will go, where the lights will go. This is very, very crucial for the composition. Notice that my ground here is light. So I may put a little bit lighter tint to the bottom part. It's usually a good idea to leave the ground transparent. I don't know if we'll end up doing it today, but it does work beautifully for most of the paintings. One note. Uh, the paper towels uh, quality is different nowadays. Yes, paper is not more expensive, so it is important to remove all those little fibers that keep fraying from it. Otherwise, they will end up in paint and impede the painting process quite a bit. I don't know if it's visible, but it is a very important aspect. Okay, now that we've got initial tint that kills the brightness of the canvas, the next step is to draw the composition. By drawing, I don't mean drawing the whole thing completely. I'm just trying to place initially the figures, maybe bottom part of the skirt, top part of the head, another head, just to see how it all fits in the canvas. Using the plumb line, I will determine where the foot will go of the right figure and just trying to see how it will all look. At this stage, I'm not particular with uh, measuring exactly. I just want to see how the forms will fit comfortably on the canvas. Uh, in this case, I'm going to move the right figure a little bit to the right Actually, the whole thing will go to the right because I would like to put more flowers, more background behind uh, this uh, figure in the white shirt. So now I'm getting a bit tighter with the drawing. It's still not recognizable as a figure. Very important part would be to look at the figure and see that the batok goes a little bit more than halfway through between the bottom of the foot and top of the head. So that would give me a nice guideline to where the bench goes. And place the body of the right model right here. Now she's a bit thinner here. So here comes the handy paper towel. We go right here. Figure is kind of dark, I might as well block it in since it's a warm color. The hand will go directly underneath here. That's good. Then I will compare this distance to this distance. It kind of sounds dry and scientific, but to me, this is the best way to draw. Uh, you don't really need to how to draw almost if you can measure those distances and look at the angles. So let's block it in. Very simple. Okay, and then the foot will of course go closer since we are moving the figure. We need to remember to move the foot. So we've got approximate placement of one figure. Then another one. The reason why I'm dealing it with this way uh, normally, mainly painters start with values. They try to put value patterns uh, first. My idea is to make sure that the figures are anatomically correct in this case, because they're doing weird twists. The whole painting may not work out, so we'll worry about the values later. Actually, 
I did do my homework and thought about it, how the values will go. So that would be the second figure. The knee is lower. It will be dark as well. So we have a little bit of an angle for the bench. The skirt does fantastic things here. We may develop it into a fancy shape. Then draw a plumb line and see approximately where the foot goes in relationship to the rest of the figure. Now the bench. I'm tempted to stretch the bench just a tiny bit to the left. This will be our horizontal. So it will show a bit more and it will go somewhere here. This is very simple because it's like an architectural drawing. Um, this is an interesting point. It would be a good idea to break this back if it becomes too red with the uh, railing. So I may, may leave it open for future decisions whether I should move this uh, armrest to the left or not. angle. Now that the whole thing is blocked in, I'm going to decide on my dark values where this will, where they will go and because we do not have anything really specific that uh, will be included behind the models, I'm going to first focus on the, this is the cast shadow that goes between the models. It kind of connects with both figures and only the light part of the hand is visible even almost blended. So we've got this kind of central shape that's very unappealing. But if we extend it maybe and connect it behind with some kind of plants here and then maybe put some darks right there, the whole dark and light pattern will become more interesting. It's connected all together. It's a bit of a cast shadow coming from the model this way and connecting with the dark shape there. In general, it's a good idea to keep those darks connected. It gives the painting a little bit of a better composition. Especially in case of impressionistic paintings, it's nice to watch those shapes going. I'm going to move back now and see if the overall shapes work together or not. The painting should be predominantly light or dark. Okay, uh, now that I looked back, this is a bit empty here because we have this dynamic situation going on. I can either decide maybe put something dark here or maybe continue with this dark right there. The possibilities are endless, but uh, let's say for the sake of this uh, demo, I'm going to put like an implied cast shadow coming from the left. Maybe there is another figure there or flower pot. We'll decide later and we'll skip this uh, light, this dark, sorry. So now is the time to redraw what we've got, which means a bit more specific shapes. And the most important thing is to exaggerate what uh, we are doing in terms of contour. And this exaggeration, some people do it arbitrarily. I like to exaggerate intersections, which means there are places in the body where different forms join together. It's a good idea to measure it. It's about more than one third through, so the head is bigger. Okay, it connects with the dark there. And there are little dips in the form that I'm going to explore. I'm still at my burnt sienna or transparent red oxide. Maybe we'll exaggerate a little bit of a curvature of the back. Why not? Boom, boom, boom. And there will be a little bit of light coming this way. The 
sleeve goes this way. Let's remeasure. The hand seems to be a bit long. I actually don't like this lineup. There is a elevated waist of the skirt lining up with the sleeve. It's not a good idea to uh, keep things lined up or tangent, so let's ignore it. The hand will go right there. How about we move her out a little bit and this will be part of the shadow. That will work better. This stage takes a lot of time and I uh, never rush it because uh, everything else, once you have it done the right way, follows naturally and it's much easier to do. So I'm really trying to make sure that the figure is properly placed. The darks have nice shapes and so do the lights. In general, it's a good idea to connect all those darks. Let's cast shadow. Joins with the arm. There we go. comes the shoe. What I like about those shoes is that they don't make the painting too sweet. If you have too many sweet things in the painting, then it becomes kind of boring. I'm going to skip this little fold of the dress. It doesn't do anything to the composition. The important thing is to place the shoe properly. There are angles within the photograph. Notice that you can take and move those angles, transfer them to your painting and get exact drawing. It really helps this way. And actually most of the time that's what I've been doing with my drawing, transferring the angles. Not worried about the light on the dress yet, just block it in. Just getting the correct shape is more important. Okay, there will be fingers coming here. Let's not worry about them. <laughs> Looks like a club now. Okay, the foot. This is pretty dark, except of the sock. That will make a nice accent. And then immediately I will progress with another skirt. And there is an opportunity to do something very interesting here in terms of overlaps. The natural tendency would be to draw it down, even though it's not down in the photograph. I'm going to probably overlap it more and move it in a little bit more. And then come up with the waist and make sure that it lines up properly with the, in the middle of puffy sleeve angle of the back and again I may exaggerate a little bit of a buttock here to give it a nice stretched shape. The figure on the right is stretched. Okay. I'm blocking the whole head together with the face, the hair, everything goes in one continuous shape. All right. Now is the time to check on the other one. There is a shoe right here, or a foot with the flip-flop, I think. It doesn't look too good, so I'm just going to pretend that the skirt rests on the bench and hope nobody can tell. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Well, imagine that the foot is somewhere hidden behind the body and that will be, okay, it goes right underneath here. 
When I'm doing the drawing, I keep two things in mind. One thing is the general shape the figure creates. Another one is the planes of the body or anatomy of the body. So uh, every once in a while, I do a reality check. Does it make sense? Does it look human? And if it doesn't, then uh, things need to be corrected. Time to move to a little bit darker darks now. Viridian with transparent red oxide or burnt sienna does marvelous things, especially if it's done with my old beaten up brush. That's what they teach you at university, how not to take care of your materials. <laughs> Actually, I did learn quite a bit there. It wasn't painting. Notice that I'm not uh, creating any whites, lights here on the skirt. It just goes as a shape. The reason why I'm jumping to the skirt because it's a huge shape and it's going to dictate what is the next thing I'm going to do with my uh, composition. And because it's so dark and big, it's important to make sure that it looks interesting enough to be included in this painting. Okay, the shoe, it sort of blends with the skirt. And then more of it comes in. Let's see, we need to decide how it drapes. How about we give it more of a dynamic angle? Nobody will ever be able to tell how this shoe really um, looks like or how the dress really looks like because nobody will be comparing it with the photograph, hopefully. So this is a nice opportunity to create something that we like without worrying about likeness. Okay, another dark shape that we are going to have is the model's head, the hair. And it's got off. The blouse is sticking out a bit on her. We are going to reduce it, but excuse me. All right. So now comes the hair. And again, I may want to pause and see. This is a high-waisted skirt, so it goes a bit higher. Pause and see how the hair lines up with the dress with the other model. It's also pretty dark. We'll lighten it on one side. This is actually a lighter side. And then drapes here. And the head is pretty, pretty dark. It may not be that dark, but maybe a bit darker than what we have. Now that we have those big shapes in place, I'm going to repaint some of the darks. We will need a little bit more uh, cool colors there. However, some of the warm will stay because it's nature and it's never going to be or shouldn't be too dark. So if the terpenoid doesn't allow me to, I take a rug and kind of wipe some of the dark. It needs to have some green there. If it's too hot, it won't look right even more green there we go especially here it's cooler on top some of it may appear and some of it will this is very important will pick up right here behind the model because the bench is oops wrong brush bench is transparent in some places it has openings the cutouts it will connect the painting together again i'm going to kind of soften it with the brush and then again on the bottom. And then on the other side, we'll treat it in a minimal kind of way. This cast shadow on the bottom that we sort of started here, 
probably will continue through the model's legs in some way. And uh, I'm going to paint it different color, probably go with some purple right on top because it is on the ground and the sky reflects uh, in there. Time for the bench. This is more boring than the figures, unfortunately, um, because it is an architectural form and it needs to be rendered rather precisely. Okay, the angles. It's kind of boring, I know, but has to be done rather precisely. Otherwise, it won't look right. It still should be painted loosely. There will be some light on it. OK, this is a very interesting thing. The natural tendency, we all have natural tendencies of a mechanical person. And uh, we have a tendency to make things that are symmetrical, predictable, and uniformly spaced. Most of the time, it's almost asking to go right in the middle of those two distances and make it extremely boring. Even if it's on the photograph, uh, we shouldn't do it. It's better to move it left or right, either way. Even if the bench is crooked, it's probably going to look better than placing it right dead in the center. And that pertains to the whole painting. Sometimes uh, it's a good idea to step back, take a look, and see what things line up, what don't. don't. And correct them, even though they may not be correct. OK, this bench will create a shadow, cast shadow, that goes right down here. So this would be another shadow. It's not going to be so dark. So right from the start, I'm going to keep it simple and maybe work on a skirt a little bit more. It doesn't look pretty. Maybe the buttock needs to be a bit more pulled down. better. The other side of the bench, as we said before, this is horizontal. And then according to the loss of perspective, if you are looking down at things, this armrest will go somewhere here. It's, I mentioned before, I wasn't sure if I'm going to put it against the model. Let's try it before uh, we do anything. This is not working properly. Hold on, I need to take closer look. Those green ornaments were placed in the wrong place. So let's go again, do the armrest first. Maybe I should have made this decision right from the start and then worried about ornaments. OK, they will go a little bit below. This is the stuff that you see coming from behind that will connect the whole composition together. There are like beads on the string, those little shapes. If they're not connected in some way, the painting may not work. OK. Almost touching the model, but not quite. Another dark shape that's uh, there that uh, is smaller, but also significant, it's like an accent, is the shoe. And then, of course, the shape of the shadow, cast shadow, going right under the model. It's uh, initially going to be blocked in a warm way. And then I'm going to the leg that's darker. OK. Be dark, but not that dark. Well, 
Those cast shadows are very important because they will connect the whole composition together. Okay, this is how far it goes. That's better. This one I can't see, but I imagine it's somewhere here, this other side of the bench, and it also casts the shadow. It connects to the edge of the canvas right here. More terpenoid. Do. Okay, it's called painting with the paper towel. Now, maybe this should be a bit of a narrower form. We don't want to, for the shadow coming from this side, dominate so much. Next thing I would do, providing the drawing is correct or sort of correct, is to jump into red paint. And the reason for it, it is a dominant color here. It's very strong. And we need to see how it will work in the composition. The color has to go lower. So let's lock it in as one shape. I'm just using cadmium red with leftover on my brush from the burnt sienna. Now, as I'm doing it, I'm trying to pay attention to what's happening with the contour of the hand, and I'm trying to exaggerate it, keeping in mind that there is a shoulder here, the sleeve ends here, and then the hand has muscles that make it kind of bumpy. Usually when I draw with darks, I draw, go a little bit beyond where I need to go because I like to go on top with light colored paint and to create an interesting, hopefully, edge. Okay. At this stage, I also like to um, kind of push the paint in the canvas. I want to keep it transparent. This hair is kind of red here, so we might as well throw this in, bring it to the right a bit more. Okay. A little bit darker here under where the sleeve is. And sometimes those large areas are going to be left uh, transparent and kind of scratchy. Once you varnish the painting, there is a nice dynamics developing between the lights and darks. This hand I would move out a little bit. Ah, oh, there we go. Maybe even angle it more. Let's see what happens. There will be a bump here. It will be sort of the light of the hand will be connected with a little bit of a bench at this stage. All right. This is an organic hole. This is a boring kind of a stage of a painting because uh, there is nothing exciting happening in terms of finished uh, looking figure. Things are off but it's important to get it right because the rest of the painting will progress much faster if it's done right. And the tendency would be to jump now into some of this opaque paint and put lights on the dress, but uh, how about if we decide to move the figure of the hand and it becomes a problem because we need to deal with all this light There. Okay. Going great. At 
this stage, I also try to have larger edges uh, kind of um, correct or 100% correct if I can help it. So they can be left alone if, of course, everything works out. Now, this dress also does certain things. I'm not really happy with how it looks on the photograph. So I'm going to take a look at it and maybe edit it. Especially the shape, it looks odd because I suspect this dress does not have even hem. It's uh, kind of a pointed uh, veil type of um, fashion. <laughs> And in this case, it may look weird, so let's see if we could do something with that that looks more like the real skirt. Now, here is a connection between the two. Again, it's very, it should be planned in such a way that uh, those distances right here the shoe and right here are not the same. It, there's a tendency to make things the same and that doesn't work very well. But as I say, I try to connect things right away. Okay, there's a little bit of a dark under the figure. I might as well block it in and see how it connects with the bench. back of the figure and probably her hair. Okay, an angle here. That works. Now for the sake of drawing, I probably wouldn't do it in a different way, but sometimes it's a good idea to look at where the other knee goes. This is the anatomy coming into play. The knee has to continue as a thigh and go into the body. So this would be the top of the knee. The scra scratch it out if um, somebody needs to see it or keep it in mind. This is where the knee goes and it has to continue into the shin. So let's redraw it and into the ankle later on. A very big possibility of messing this one up. Okay, the sock will go here. I'm not going to put too much of this red paint, otherwise it will stain my uh, white and that would be quite disappointing. Now, those two skirts, the way they are connecting, again, tendency to connect them as one shape, they should overlap because there are two distinctive shapes. I decided to put it this way. I don't really think it really matters as long as uh, the distinction is being made. Another thing is that the way you see it on the photographs right here, there is a fold that looks sort of like her lap, but it's not. It looks ambiguous, and if we decide to paint it this way, it will definitely look wrong. So we need to keep it in mind that uh, her lap is lower and skip this fold, ignore it altogether, and just continue with the waist. This situation happens all the time when we are painting with life figures. The fabric does weird things, and if we continue with all those weird things that fabric does, uh, the figure may not look at an anatomically correct and we need to uh, go back sometimes to a dry painting and fix it. That's my costume designer speaking. I used to work as a costume designer for theaters many years ago and uh, I've seen a lot of fabric in my life, a lot of costumes. Maybe that's why I'm attracted to this subject matter. It does something to me. Right, it's time to go back 
and assess the damage. Okay, now that I took a look, it's not bad, but it's still, this is not what I like. Maybe it needs to be reshaped differently. We need to really watch those shapes, otherwise maybe it should go a little bit different. It just looks wrong. Of course, when we do the contour and bring the leg out here and then continue it, it won't look so confusing, but as a shape, it should work. Also, I think, try to move those figures closer together, but I think they are getting too close, closer than they are on a photograph. They will look more intimate. Okay, the head will go right here, where it is. Next step. I like to work with brights in initial stages of painting because they give a little bit more transparent look. You can see the canvas texture. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to put some uh, value and color on uh, the areas behind the models. And at the same time, I will try to correct the drawing. That is a good opportunity. Okay, here it comes a little bit of green. Blends in nicely with the paint. It's going to be relatively light with some dark accents. Maybe it's a little bit of viridian in it will do. Straight viridian, oops, it's too straight, I guess. It doesn't. Sienna doesn't look as good. Painting with the paper towel. Proofy sleeve here, puffy sleeve. And dark, the face looks kind of dead. A little bit of the dark of the hair. It's really light, so I don't want to get too much of this transparent dark in here. Very good. will definitely be the challenge since I move this other figure in but I think the distance between them is too big and they look kind of too separate. As painters we are allowed to have certain degree of uh, freedom in terms of how we um, present the reality, but too much freedom brings poor results too. So every once in a while, we need to do a reality check and really see if the distortion works. One of my teachers back at uh, the university times said that painting is about distortion. And by that, he probably meant uh, expression or exaggeration of certain elements and we definitely cheat a lot of times as artists without even quite realizing that we are cheating. For example, uh, we exaggerate the colors, we exaggerate the shapes, we exaggerate the directions and then we change a lot of things, models, costumes for instance, we include elements that are there in the painting that 
they may not be there in real life. Okay. So this is a big lie we do, but uh, if we can get away with it, then the painting probably will look more exciting than the painting you do directly from photograph and you present it uh, uh, to the world as truth. It probably will look more false now that we got used to all forms of exaggeration. That may, okay. that may be more desirable than doing direct copies. Plus, it's more fun. Okay, I'm going to get rid of this reddish contour. My definition of drawing is not about linear kind of drawing. It's about getting the proper placement of various uh, elements, proper measurements. So actually, in painting, the way I paint, it's not a good idea to have contour. Of course, there are many ways of painting, and uh, there are painters who do use contour a lot. Let's say Art Nouveau illustrators, they are very good at it, but that's not what I'm trying to do. Whatever works. It's fine. Okay, a little bit of greener, green stuff. It should go sort of horizontally behind because we want we don't want to have things too topsy turvy. Let's put some color on the bench. I'm going to use a little bit of cobalt blue. Cobalt blue is a weak color, but I'm used to it. I like it. And uh, I've learned over the years how to deal with it. It has its problems. It's, for example, not as transparent as ultramarine blue. And people who like transparent uh, paint may not be fond of it. Actually, it doesn't really matter what pigments we are using because a lot of things could be mixed and if the whole system works, then there is no need to change things. Let's say if people are used to working with Prussian blue, if it works, then there is no need to all of a sudden jump to cobalt just because somebody says so. Okay, I'm going to throw a little bit of purple here, except I'm putting too much blue. Okay. There we go. The shape of the shadow. I'm going to push it out a little bit more so it touches the back. Maybe not all the way, but to a certain degree. comes in form of the rug. It's a bit of contour from the leftover drawing. I'm going to remove it. And actually, some of the stuff that uh, the painting, uh, I mean, painting with the rug does uh, actually looks cool. I remember one day I had somebody in the class who took from me for years. And then I showed painting the rag, and it was like a major discovery for this person. I don't know if it did it for him, but I remember the joy of discovery of painting with the rag. <laughs> he actually quit the class after that. <laughs> mm. So I told him, why didn't you tell me? about the simple solutions that being would have told you wouldn't have to take the class at all. But unfortunately, 
maybe it was a joke, the whole thing. And the painting with the rug and... He probably absorbed everything he needed and moved on. That's probably what it was. There will be darks showing through. I'm not going to block them yet. Just a flimsy drawing now because uh, it's an architectural form. It will be ready to move into lights anytime soon. Make sure it's straight and well kind of connected with the background. Okay. Now, it's a good idea right from the start to move the edges in such a way that they kind of uh, blend a little bit with the background, they merge with the background. Uh, if, for example, you decide to quit the painting at a certain stage, uh, it can dry and you can go with wet paint easily without worrying about uh, how the edges will look like. You will have some soft edges there and you can fake it. Of course, it is a good idea to do everything in one stretch, but uh, it's not always possible. Okay. The other side of the bench. This is actually quite warm. The reason why I'm getting cool underneath, some of it will show, if you go with warm paint right on top, it looks quite uh, dynamic if you leave some of that showing. Okay. I'm not going to work on the uh, plants right away. We're going to use a different photograph for it something that has more variety than this boring hedge. Okay. Too much of an outline. I'm, I'm eager to jump into those lights, but unfortunately we have to hoard the horses. It's very difficult to refrain from jumping into trans uh, opaque per paint. By opaque, I mean paint that contains white. Okay, let's give it a little bit more kick. So we'll have a shadow developing right here. You could get away with uh, not painting with the rug, actually, if uh, you use uh, one of the painting mediums, you can dilute the paint more. The reason why I don't use media is because they smell bad. I just don't like the smell of it. But uh, with the medium, you don't probably have to work just as hard and wipe it. Whatever works. Okay, now it's the time to paint the shadow part of a bench and depending how precise you are going to be, you may have to go into higher level mathematics, which by that I mean you may have to go and basically almost like measure three, three more and measure all those slats so they kind of make sense or you can kind of gauge approximately if your painting is more of an impressionistic nature and just worry about maybe leaving nice opening here so you can see, uh, you don't see a little bit of a slat here, but it, the, the light space uh, of the plants behind will, uh, will offer a little bit of a punch. There will be like bright green showing here. Let's put some of it right here and it will give you extra punch. Remember when we are talking about those beads being strung on a thread? That's what we are trying to do right here. There we go. That would be here. Okay, one, two. Ah, there is no time to be too precise. Just block it in. 
and this green will show up later in probably uh, opaque form with some white into it. Okay, now I'm going to focus on a little bit of drawing, since the green is here, of the figure with the proper brush. And again, double check, I think she's a bit fatter. A little bit more body right here. However, it's important to go right away into the contour right here. So the shoulder, arm comes from the shoulder. There is an armpit. Those are important things to consider. All right. Now is the time to fill up all the gaps that are protruding in the picture. This is not light. And some of it, at this stage, since the paint started drying, could be just left alone and go with the paint. If it drips, if the drips are undesirable, then, of course, paper will come to the rescue. So now it's like coloring book kind of experience. Careful. And at the same time, when I'm doing it, trying to fill it in, I may go and throw some of this green, light green paint. This landscape is not dark in a solid way. There are big holes in that. And of course, there are holes in the bench. There we go. It's not a good idea to scratch the canvas unless you work in a transparent fashion. And that's what I'm trying to do right now. In general, verticals are um, darker than horizontals if we are dealing with the same color and of the same value. So I will leave the ground kind of light. We may have to darken it a little bit depending on what comes out here. It's confusing, it's too much stuff here. It's relevant, this part. Okay. Well, I'm going to spend a little bit of time checking the drawing on my figures, and I'm going to go into um, the opaque situation with opaque paint. This is the bench. It connects the whole composition. Leftover slots. Excellent. There are two ways to start this painting. One would be um, to start with the white blouse because it's such a dominant value, but because the painting is done outside, I'm not going to paint what I see outside, but I'm going to bring the third photograph in just to throw some ideas. This is the inspiration for the background. We are not going to use exactly the whole thing. It's too much, but maybe borrow some of those flowers, some of those leaves. It's pretty green with peach and a little bit of purple and uh, real dark somewhere on the very bottom of the bushes. Very important in the choice of photographs, if we are working from different sources, is to make sure that the light is of the same or similar quality, uh, which means comes from the left, maybe 45 degrees. Otherwise, the painting will look wrong. So the temperature of light should look close. We can fake a little bit on that, but it should be close enough and uh, it should be coming from the same direction. If it doesn't, then we need to fake it. That's possible. I've done it before, but uh, it is too much to worry about. And
okay so what I'm going to do now because we are using the photograph with the background I'm going to use some of those background colors in transparent way just to set the tone and uh, of course we are going to focus on the green I'm not going to worry about the transparent green Viridian of course is not going to do it it's need, there needs to be some cadmium yellow in it I'm jumping to cadmium yellow medium it gives it nicer warmer tone and notice that I'm mixing a little bit more paint than I need at this stage but it's better to have too much paint than too little uh, too yellow maybe a little bit more viridian some of this sap and let's see what happens let's dilute it just a little bit to give a little bit of a transparent feel to it too bright Okay, that's approximately what we are going to do with our um, opaques. I'm going to apply a lot of it in a transparent fashion, so some of the background will show some of the initial background layout. And when I'm doing it, it's going to be done in such a way that will work for the head first. This is where the painting starts. Hello and welcome to the demo on painting people from photographs. Uh, there are certain situations that ask us to paint from photographs as opposed to painting from life, especially when we are dealing with younger people and especially if we are dealing with difficult poses. This is what today's demo will be about. Before I get to the point, I would like to explain my materials. I use oil paint, of course, a titanium white, cadmium yellow, cadmium yellow medium, yellow ochre, cadmium red, alizarin crimson permanent, transparent red oxide, sub-green viridian, and cobalt blue. When it comes to brushes, I prefer to work in larger sizes, as large as I can get, relatively, uh, of course, to the size of canvas. Today we are working on 20 by 24, double all prime linen, medium texture. Now, when it comes to working from photographs, uh, I selected these images. Uh, this is an enlargement of uh, the larger photograph. You have two figures of young girls incapable of standing still for hours. Because of the setup here, I am not uh, really uh, going to use the background behind. I don't like it, it's busy. However, for some painters it might uh, do. So I selected the photograph of uh, uh, somewhere uh, rose garden. And uh, I'm not going to paint roses, but I like the light um, spots of splashes of nice color and value. And that's what we are going to imply behind the figures. This is what paintings for, from photographs does. To dilute the paint in initial stages of painting, I use odorless uh, terpenoid or mineral spirits. And uh, I don't use many, any medium except when I'm traveling. Sometimes I use whatever comes across from a local manufacturer. When it comes to diluting the paint, you use, I use a lot of terpenoid in initial stages, so the whole thing gets saturated. And when I'm looking at the photograph in this case, or a model, I'm trying in my head to plan where the darks will go where the lights will go. This is very crucial for the composition. 
notice that my ground here is light. So I may put a little bit lighter tint to the bottom part. It's usually a good idea to leave the ground transparent. I don't know if we'll end up doing it today, but it does work beautifully for most of the paintings. Okay, now that we've got initial tint that kills the brightness of the canvas, the next step is to draw the composition. By drawing, I don't mean drawing the whole thing completely. I'm just trying to place initially the figures. First, focus on the, this is the cast shadow that goes between the models. It kind of connects with both figures and only the light part of the hand is visible. We've got the figure here. Let's follow with a little bit of, that's a kind of interesting situation with this slat. She lines up with her batok, and that's another problem that we are trying to avoid. Problem with the hand is too big. I think she's a child. She has a doubt hand, just a tiny bit narrower. Maybe even if I lose it a little bit, that will that will help. A little bit shorter knuckle. All right, it is finished. I'm very happy about it. I had a lot of fun. I hope you did too. Thank you very much and goodbye. Well, that's a classic figure on park bench with Sylvia Tribeck and you can learn more about this video at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, we have a special discount today only. You can find the code in the comments section. I want to remind you, we put together a video just for you. It's called 97 Amazing Painting Secrets from the World's Leading Artists, filled with great painting tips. It's a $100 value and it's two hours in length and it's yours for free. Just go to 97tips.com. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Eric Rhodes.